file systems. In understanding the basics of file systems, one of the first questions that come up is understanding what is the purpose of a file system. A file system helps you organize your space. A hard disk is really a large set of bits that are organized by, well, into bytes and organized by addresses. And you can use the addresses to address anything on the entire hard disk. So you have this, this huge space with lots of addressable bytes. And then you have to decide, well, okay, if I want to store data on this, how can I store it? If you have a large, gigantic file, maybe your file is a one terabyte file, you can start from the very beginning of the drive and start writing the file out. And then at the end of the file, you'd have it all written there. And you could just read that single file back and it'd be fine. But sometimes you want to put more than one thing in there. So if you put two files in there, the question is, well, where does one file begin and the next one, well, where does one end and the next one begin? And you have to decide how to keep it organized. So a file system allows you to overlay a piece of information that contains all the addresses in a, in that partition and lets you keep track of where files are, what space is available, what permissions are set, which users have what permissions, and all the information they can use to provide security or organization. So how much space does the disk really have? When you go in there and you look at your machine and you see how much space it has, is that the real amount? Well, not usually. Usually what you're seeing is how much space is available in the file system. So then how do you know which disks you have? Well, you can use some of the GUI tools, or you can use tools such as FDisk, which will allow you to see which disks you have, which partitions you have. And then even you can look in there and figure out things like how they are formatted and set up. So what is a partition table? Well, when you take your original disk and you decide to break it into individual pieces, there is a table, use the very front of the disk, that will tell you where a partition begins and where it ends. Partitions are individual, well, blocks that we turn into volumes. And there are two main formats that are currently in use. There is the MBR, which is the master boot record, and then there is the GPT. GPT is, uh, well, it's an acronym that contains an acronym. And the G is GUID, which is Globally Unique Identifiers, and then PT is Partition Table, so GUID Partition Table. So MBR was written with the idea that machines would only go into 32 bits, and because of that, the addresses are only 32 bits, which means that your largest, I mean, you, you basically only address beginning and ending of partitions in 32-bit numbers. And if you know much about 32-bit numbers, that basically means you have 4 billion different possible addresses. And so that's how you would have to have your partition set up to be based on the idea that there are only 4 billion addresses. You'll find that's quite a bit of a problem with 32-bit file, um, file systems as well as the MBR, and it limits it quite a bit. With larger hard drives, in order to be able to address everything, you have GPT, which has much larger, well, addresses. And it also resolved quite a few smaller issues with MBR, such as the number of partitions you could create. MBR originally was limited. It didn't have things like extended partitions and logical partitions and, and well, anyway, it was, it was a mess. So GPT solved a lot of that. So then how do you edit the partition table? Well, you can use the fdisk command to edit it. And once you edit the partition table, you write it out. And what it does is it writes out to your, well, either MBR or GPT, and that information is stored there. But then the kernel doesn't know about it unless the kernel goes back in and rereads that information so it knows about it. 
So you can use things like part probe or other utilities to tell the kernel that it needs to reread the partition tables and reload that information. And then it can start using that information as it mounts partitions and puts them into its setup. So what partition types are good? Well, at this point, it's probably a good idea to actually create some partitions so we can get some ideas of how it works. So let's jump into it. I have right here settings. My machine is currently turned off. I can go over to storage and click on my controller SATA. And then I want to add an extra disk. So I create a new disk. And this will be a nice virtual disk, dynamic allocated. And I can go with whatever size I want. Um, let's just go with a one gigabyte. It's a nice small disk. And I can keep new virtual disk, or I can just say spare. doesn't really matter what I call it. I create it. And then it's ready to go. Once my machine boots up, I will be able to use that partition or use that disk and make partitions out of it. So I'll go and start that. All right. I kind of skipped through the booting process. Now I am ready to log in. So I log in to root with my password Aloha123. And I go into my machine. Now, at this point, I have the option of either using command line utilities or the GUI. You want to probably get used to using command line tools because the GUI isn't always there. But let's look at the first the GUI. So I click on applications and go down to utilities and I can see there's this disks option here. I created my old disk and that one is 32 gigabytes and then the new one is 1.1 gigabytes and it's all unknown space. So now you can also see the device name is dev slash dev slash sdb. The first one is slash dev slash sda and I guess it's got multiple partitions in it, SDA1 and SDA2. In the SDA2, I can see that the partition type is Linux Volume Management, LVM, which means I can then create individual, well, volumes inside of that. The original one is a standard partition, and that one is where I have my kernel and other information stored. So I want to work with this second disk. And I can click on icons here and create stuff, or I can drop down to the command line to show you how that works. So go to the terminal. All right. So in order to build partitions, I can do F disk minus L to list all my partitions. It shows me I have a couple of different partitions. You can see there is a slash dev slash SDA and a slash dev slash sdb sdb is well 1073 megabytes so i will go edit that one so i do f disk slash dev slash sdb and i can use my m key to show me my options this will list all the commands i can use p is to print my partition table and i have no partitions so I want to add a new partition. So I do N for new. I can decide what kind of partition it's going to be. And this one is going to be a primary partition. So P, partition number one. And I can decide what my first sector is. I can just press enter here and decide how big this is. I have a full gigabyte to work with. So I will make this first one, let's make it 200 megabytes. So I do plus 200 M. It creates the partition. I can then use P to print my partition table and I can see the type is Linux. Linux works great if I want to make a file system. Other options I can also list with the L option. And you can see there are quite a few different partition types. And all of these partition types are listed in hexadecimal index values or type values. So Linux is 83. If I want to do swap, it's 82. Uh, I can also do things like LVM and other partitions as well. So LVM is 8E. 
I'm going to leave this as a standard Linux partition type. So I will do write w, and then I will be out. At this point, I can type in part probe, and it does not have the command. So I can install it, yum, install part probe. And it has no package there. So we will just go ahead and assume it's there, and the kernel will just have to figure it out. So the kernel will try to read it. So to mount this, you first have to build a file system. So which file systems do I have? Well, there's the mkfs command. If I run it by itself, it tells me that here are my options. But the nice thing is this is just a front end to the other commands. So I do mkfs tab tab, and you can see these are other commands that start with mkfs. So mkfs dot, and then you have different file systems. So let's go ahead and go back to the slides. All right, so which partition types are good? Well, you want to have Linux probably for most things. All right, what file systems are available on Linux? Well, we just looked at that. The mkfs command will show you which file systems are available on your system and which ones are installed there. You usually have a couple of different things to install. There is the um, the programs or utilities type packages to go with things. So if I wanted XFS, which is already on here, there might be an XFS progs package, which would give me the XFS information. Some of these things require a kernel module to be loaded. Sometimes you have to uh, do other things, but that usually provides the utilities you need in order to format the file system. So what is the difference between different file systems? Well, some file systems have features that other ones don't. For example, the FAT32 file system, which is very common in the older DOS and early Windows operating systems, has all kinds of features to allow you to create files and do things with the files, but doesn't really have a lot with permissions. And in addition to not having permissions, it doesn't really have things like uh, SE Linux or other security features that Linux has. It works great for cameras. It works great for computers that don't have multiple users. And that's really what it's good for. When you go to other file systems, such as um, ext3, that's what a Linux file system, ext3 is different from ext2 in that ext3 added journaling. Journaling is the ability to write to your file system and tell your file system what you're going to write before you write it. And then after you write it, you remove your entry. And this makes it in a state where you don't ever get to a place where you're in the middle of writing something and you have no idea if you've completed writing it. Because you say you're going to write it, you write it, and then you remove the entry that says you're going to write it. And if you crash anywhere in the middle, then you can figure out where you're at. And you can back out of things if you can't get it completely done. EXT4 has more features added. You have XFS, which also has journaling and other Linux type um, partitions, um, permissions, and other things like that. So which file systems are supported? Well, once again, you have this um, MKFS command, which will show you when you press tab twice, which ones are available. You can install additional ones, and that's usually with using, using the yum package management system to install other packages. Sometimes you'll have to go and make kernel modifications or get kernel packages as well, but most of these are packaged in a way that makes it pretty easy to get them. So, formatting. Why do file systems need to be formatted? Well, if you mark a partition you create as, well, you create this partition, it still is just a block of space. You have to decide how to put the file system in there, and the way you do that is through formatting. What formatting does is it starts writing the file system in the beginning, and then puts in all the indications it needs through midpoints and other places 
in there so that you can, well, start doing stuff. So let's go ahead and create a, a file system. So I'll jump right in here. So I'm going to create this one as um, exe3. So mkfs exe3. And the question is, well, which partition is it? Well, we know the device was slash dev slash SDAB. And it's the very first partition I created. So it's slash dev slash SDB1. So SDB, DB, and I can see a one here. So now I type in this and it will create an ext3 file system. And that was quick. But there are other options you can add in there as well if you wanted to, such as labels and different things like that. So now that it's formatted, I can start using it, but I have to figure out where I'm going to use it and how I'm going to do stuff with it. So let's go back to our slides. How can I change how a file system is formatted? Well, let's go back to this file system and let's change it. I don't really want ext3, so let's change it to ext2. Now it's ext2. Let's change it to ext3. It's ext3. Let's change it to xfs. Now it's not xfs yet. It says that it appears to contain an ext3 file system use the minus F option to force an overwrite. So I do minus F and then it reformats it. So now it's XFS and then I can change it back to EXT3 or EXT2. And convert it back. All right. What happens if there's data on the file system and I want to convert it? Well, you can actually modify it in place for some file system types. For example, going from ext2 to ext3, all you need to do is add a journal. So if I do tune 2fs, I have the option to add a journal to the file system. So how do you do that? Well, it's with the minus j option. So I do tune 2fs minus j dev slash ext2, not ext2, uh, sdb1, and now I've added a journal. So basically, I've now converted the ext2 file system into an ext3 file system without damaging any of the files on there. But there are no files. Not really. I mean, there's, there's a empty directory for lost and found for if I lose things. But that's it. I could also do things like... Uh, add a volume label. So I want to call this my uh, maybe storage. It already has a journal, so I take that away, say fine. And I put this storage label on the partition. All right, on the file system. Now, if I want to use it, well, I just need to mount it. All right, let's go here. How do I know if a file system has been formatted? Well, sometimes you don't. The easiest way to figure it out is you try to mount the file system. If you try mounting it and it doesn't mount, usually that's an indication that it's not done correctly. It does some auto detection. That helps a lot. Um, trying to format it over it usually tells you, uh, if you're trying to go to something like XFS, it will tell you that it has something there, but you don't always know. So what is mounting then? Well, mounting is where you take part of your directory structure and you link in this new partition into that structure. So you have a directory <clears throat> and your directory can then be redirected to a new partition, a new file system, and you can start seeing things. So where are the file systems located when mounted? Well, the file systems are just integrated into this entire directory tree. You can use the mount command by itself to see which ones are currently mounted. You can also see 
what mounting options were used when mounting. Mounting options are things like mounting it as read only or read write. Um, you can mount it with um, information about how fast you can write to it, which users are allowed to do things, um, lots of things. Can you mount uncommon things like DVDs? Well, DVDs aren't that uncommon, but yes, you can mount them. You can mount them as actual DVDs, or you can even mount the ISO images. So let's go ahead and mount this partition we just created and formatted. So I have to figure out where am I going to put this partition? So I call it storage. It's a slash dev slash SDB1. So let's make a directory and we will put it, mount it there. So if I do mkdir, I can create a directory. So I'll do slash and let's say new storage. Doesn't storage. Doesn't really matter what I call it. And then if I look at my file system, there is this directory called new storage. If I go into new storage, new storage, there's nothing there. So I go back out of it. So I'm at the root of the file system and I want to mount this new partition there. So I do mount and I can tell it the mount device SDB1 and the mount partition or mount point. So new storage. So I do that command right here and it mounts it. If I go into this new storage directory, I can see there is a lost and found directory here. This lost and found directory is stored at the root of any ext type file system. So now I can see it's mounted, which is kind of great. Of course, if I reboot the system, it will no longer be mounted because I manually mounted it and it's not being automatically mounted. So that could be kind of a problem. So what is the file system table? Well, the file system table is a file on the file system that tells you where everything is mounted and how they're mounted. So I can actually have this directory automatically have my new partition mounted to it at boot time. So how do I edit this file system table? Well, you use a nano or some other editor and you edit the slash etc slash fs tab file. Okay. Then we have to figure out if it's working and look at what happens if I mess up. So I was mounting the device SDB1 to new storage. So I'll do nano. I'll tell the etc fs tab. If I go in here, I can see these are the partitions that are mounted. So I'm going to add a new partition here. So you first start with the device. My device is slash dev slash sdb1. You have some space, it could be a space, a tab. I just put a tab. My mount point is new storage. Then I have to tell it what type it is. This is ext3. Give it the defaults. And then these numbers indicate things like backups and um, other stuff. Just put zeros here, you're fine. Exit out. Now there's this file. Because it's mounted, well, I should be able to use the mount command and see that it's mounted. And you can see at the very last line down here, there is a indication that this thing is mounted. I can see which things, which options are in place. It's read, write. I can see it's mounted to ext3. And I can unmount it with the umount command. umount slash dev slash sdb1. Or I can tell it the mount point. So I can unmount it that way. Or I can remount it. And unmount it. With the mount point. Either way, it will get it unmounted. Then I can run the mount command by itself, and I can see that it is no longer mounted. Now, if I try running the mount command, mount dev sdb1, well, what happens? It mounts. And the reason it mounts is because it looks at this device and says, where is that device at? And then it finds the fs tab file and sees the device listed in there as the last entry. 
and it knows where to mount it. So I run this mount command again, and I can see that it is mounted right there in this new storage directory. I can U mount that again, new storage. And then if I want to mount the new storage, I can just tell it to do mount new storage and it'll mount it because once again, it looks up in the FS tab or file system table file and figures out what it needs to mount and how to mount it. And then I can type the mount command again and once again, see that it is mounted correctly. Now, if I mess up this file, let's go ahead and mount it first and then nano etc fs tab and let's say i tell it some directory that doesn't exist like new storage without the e. if i try mounting mount dev sdb1 it says mount point new storage does not exist so if i try mount new storage it says it can't find it in the FS tab file. So you can see what it's going on here. That's how it's doing it. Now imagine what would happen if you booted up your system like this and you had a mistake in there. Well, that could be bad, especially if it's a critical file system for your system to run. It could cause the entire system to basically crash. You don't want that. That's bad. All right, back to the slides. What features are available with a file system? Well, you have all kinds of features. You have the ability to read and write to files, edit files, set permissions on files. You can use things like SE Linux, disk quotas, all kinds of things. So permissions, how do they work? Well, the way they work in Linux is each file has some kind of an associated number. And the associated number indicates well what the permissions are you have users and you have groups and you can see all this information with the stat command so if i go into my file system new let's create a new file so i use the touch command oh, actually it's not mounted is it mount new storage go to new storage do touch new file txt if i do a directory listing i can see that the new file is owned by root and it's zero bytes in size it's kind of a small file if i do stat new file i get some information about this new file i can see the size i can see the blocks it takes up other information i can see information about inodes and links and then i see this access permissions well it says it is 0644 zero in the front is for things like your set user id and set group id and your sticky bit the six and the four four indicate the user the group and the world permissions you can see the owner is uid zero the group is UID zero. You can see the SE Linux context is listed right here. Basically, it's kind of unlabeled. And you can see all the information about its access, modification, and change times. So that's all there. And that's all stored. Most of that's stored right there in the inode, not the actual file name. It's stored in the inode that the file um, is linked to. So when you create a directory, your directory has a list of file names and those file names are pointed to inodes on the system that allow you to then edit and modify the contents on the system. So how does SE Linux work on a file system? Well, you set your SE Linux um, context and then the SE Linux piece is tied to the kernel so that whenever you have access or try to access a file, it looks at the kernel, asks the kernel what it says. The kernel looks at SE Linux and says, yeah, you're allowed or no, you're not allowed, and it blocks it. It doesn't matter what your permissions say. If SE Linux blocks you, 
then you don't get to the permission level and you can't see it. So that can be a bit of a problem. It also makes things a lot more secure if you have services that have to run as root and you really don't want them to be able to touch certain files. You can use SE Linux to block them from touching them even if they have full root access because they don't really have it with SE Linux. And the file system helps to support that. How do disk quotas work? Well, disk quotas, you have a couple of files on the system and then those files are updated whenever you make modifications to the file system and they then keep track of how much space you have, what you're allowed to do, and it protects it. If a file system is read-only, then you read things, but you never modify things, including the access times. Access times for files don't change if you're reading it from a read-only file system. Read-only file systems are great when you don't want someone to mess with something. So, anyway, that is your lecture on file systems.